late anyway. Uh, addiction, uh, the levels of use, uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is, is you become addicted to a drug. Uh, addiction is the difference between uh, the di difference between abuse and addiction is the compulsive behavior of the uh, of the addict. Uh, if you are um, mer merely abusing the drug, you have control over it. Uh, if you're addicted, you don't have control over it. It has control over you. Addiction is is the classification if the individual has no control over duration or usage uh, or the amount that they use. Uh, they continue to have to use more and more and more. Uh, and we can, uh, we'll talk about that later with, with each individual drug. The individual has been unsuccessful at control, so that the, the uh, substance is controlling them. They're not controlling the substance. Uh, they spend an inordinate amount of time obtaining drugs or recovering from usage. Uh, I keep telling you about my friend who, <laughs> I brag about him because he, he, uh, he had three kids that were born within a week of one another. He had his ex-wife. His ex-wife, he got his ex-wife pregnant, his wife pregnant, and his girlfriend pregnant all at the same time. Not at the same, I, I, have, I don't know, I don't care, I don't want to even think about it. But they gave birth within one week of each other, so he's got three kids that almost have the same birthday. <laughs> but they're from three different women. Anyway, uh, most of the time what he is doing is looking for pot. He's seeking, uh, seeking his drugs. Um, it was so bad that uh, his mother was on welfare and he would steal her welfare checks to buy his, uh, his pot, as cool as that is, or how cute as that is. Um, they limit social, occupational, or recreational activities for use. Uh, he used to work in a factory, but he stopped working in the factory because it cut into his, his uh, seeking time, so he stopped working. Uh, and he started stealing his mother's money. <laughs> That's always funny. They used to own a farm. <laughs> they used to own a farm, and in Indiana, they cut the, the, uh, the fields up into 20-acre plots. They owned about 500 acres. He lost every single one of those fields to, for one reason or another, and now they have nothing. Um, they continue use despite physical, social, relationship, or psychological problems. The only reason I know about this is because he came to my house trying to borrow money from me, found out that I was home. I don't go home all that much, but he found out that I was home, came over trying to borrow some money from me. Uh, so I got the whole story. And, it, and none of it's his fault. <laughs> He's a victim here. Not his mother. It's his mother's fault, partially, because, I mean, she's his, his, uh, his adoptive mother. <clears throat> his real mother has uh, died of uh, alcoholism in, in her early, early 30s. Uh, they use in the morning for jump start uh, on the day. They defend their drug usage with anger or even rage. Uh, so he, he, if you even suggest to this individual that he's, uh, that he's an addict, uh, he'll attack you, which is always kind of interesting. Uh, he did this to my brother. I, uh, my brother used to live with my parents. Well, my parents are gone now, but uh, he lived with my parents, and he came over to borrow money from my mom, I think. Anyway, he came over to borrow money, and he got mad because she said he was an addict. Of course, my mother's not going to mince words. She called him a son of a bitch. Uh, and uh, so he got mad, He's, he started to attack my mother, and my brother just laid him out. I mean, he, my, my brother's just a little bitty guy, he was pretty big, but uh, he was very angry, and of course you don't want to mess with my brother. My brother used to go into bars and clean the place out. Why? Because he had PTSD, that's another story. Uh, they experienced withdrawal uh, when unable to use the drug, uh, they must increase the amount used to obtain the desired effect. And he, his problem was, was marijuana. Uh, his other problem, he had another problem. He was using tie sticks when he was in Vietnam. Uh, came back with an addiction. Uh, he had an addiction to heroin, but he, he, he kicked that habit, but uh, he maintained the marijuana smoking habit. And of course, marijuana has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger as the years have gone by. Addiction uh, comprises the four C's. Uh, the loss of control, uh, compulsive use of the drug, craving the drugs, and continued use of the drugs, and those are the four C's of addiction. 
as much fun as that is. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association has identified substance use as a mental illness since the printing of the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1952. Uh, the current DSM-5 uh, divides substance abuse disorders into two, two general categories either substance-related disorders or substance-addictive disorders. Of course, the related disorders means that you're an abuser. Uh, the addictive disorders means that you're an addict and you don't have much choice. Now, the question is, why, why do these people have so much trouble? And we're going to answer that question in just a second. Uh, the DSM-5 deals with several drugs, which include alcohol, stimulants uh, like cocaine and methamphetamines, uh, cannabis, uh, cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, anxiolytics, sedatives, hypnotics, caffeine, and tobacco. Ten states in the, in the Union have uh, legalized marijuana, uh, but there are 40 states that have not, and this is one of those states. Uh, what was I? I was talking to Sue last night. She was complaining that they, had, that they didn't legalize marijuana, and the reason she was complaining is because of money. It had to do with, with <laughs> it was so confusing. <laughs> Wait a minute, you don't care if people are addicted, you just want the money? But the money was supposed to go to education, and I guess that's, that's the excuse for having such poor education in your state. It is pretty bad. They, they, you don't pay your teachers very well. You pay your teachers rock bottom wages, and that's, that's ridiculous. <clears throat> Addictive disease model, there's several disease models, that are, there's several uh, models of uh, why people are, uh, are addicts. Uh, one of them is the, the addictive disease model. This is an old, old, old concept. This is, uh, one of, this is the first concept that they came up with. This is the medical model. Uh, the model of addiction uh, sees addiction from the medical point of view, that addiction is a disease. It's chronic, it's progressive, it's relapsing, it's uh, incurable, and it's potentially fatal. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about this is that they consider it a disease, uh, like uh, catching a bacteria or having a viral infection. It's a disease, <clears throat> which drives me a little crazy. But, uh, if, so if you know anything about, the, uh, about uh, AA, AA claims that it's a disease as well. Um, I, I do have a problem with this model, and I'll, I'll, potentially I'll talk about it in just a sec. Uh, the model assumes that the addiction is caused from genetic irregularities in brain chemistry and, and anatomy that are triggered by certain drugs. Uh, research shows that heredity uh, influences drug use and addiction as much as 40 to 60 percent. So you have a, theoretically you have a, a hered hereditary proclivity for addiction, and, and that uh, seems to be true. We, uh, no matter which model you follow, addiction seems to be about 40 to 60 percent hereditary. Uh, compulsive, uh, in the addictive disease model, there's compulsive drug use with prolonged intoxication with a need to continue use, uh, the inability to control use, the inability to stop use despite physical, mental, or social problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Repeated attempts to control use, increased intake over time, of course. Uh, it's incurable. In other words, if you got it, you can't get rid of it ever. Uh, pathological reactions such as blackouts or dramatic personality <coughs> changes. This is really kind of an in interesting way to look at things. There's a reason why I don't like this model, and the reason is because they call it a disease. Uh, the other problem is that they exonerate people who have done things when they when they are drinking. Uh, if you've ever been around anybody from AA, and, and unfortunately, uh, one of my wives was uh, an alcoholic, and at one point during my life, she called me up and apologized for leaving me when she. I know it seems stupid, and I'm I'm always thinking, well, why why did you do it? <laughs> It was, it was the alcohol. Yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, they, it exonerates them, and it allows them to, uh, uh, to apologize for, for what they've done in the past. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think that you need to own up to uh, what you've done and uh, not blame it on something else. I mean, you did it, right? 
Didn't you do it? I mean, if you did it, you did it, right? That that's my problem with it. Uh, I think it's rule. It's uh, there's 12 steps. It's it's the fifth step. You have to call everybody you've ever heard. Apologize for for doing what you've done. She's called me twice actually. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> she called me once to apologize that she left me, and she called me up the second time to apologize for leaving the kids. So they weren't her kids anyway. They were my kids. Anyway, I didn't think that was right. Uh, and that's the disease model. So it gives you an excuse for, for being an addict, which I don't agree with. Uh, I like all these other things. All, these other, all, all the other models make more sense to me. Uh, behavioral environmental model, this uh, theory purports, but AA works. I'll have to admit that AA really does work, and uh, you can't argue with success. Uh, this theory purports that uh, negative environmental factors such as abuse, anger, and peer pressure uh, may cause people to seek, use, and sustain a dependence on substances. Uh, this model emphasizes the progressive nature of the six levels of drug abuse, uh, uh, abstinence, experimentation, social recreational use, habituation, abuse, and addiction. There is a problem with this model. With the disease model, you can never use again. As far as it's concerned, you, you are an incurable addict, and you will never be able to use again. So if you ever use, you may go back to where you were before. And that is true. A lot of times that's what we see. Uh, potentially that's what we were seeing with uh, Robin Williams. Uh, Robin Williams had slipped. He hadn't used for a number of years. Uh, and then something happened, and he used again and went back to rehab. After rehab, he realized that he had incurable problems uh, that, uh, that he would never be able to deal with, and uh, he committed suicide. As tragic as all this is. Um, okay. Anyway, so th this model does have a problem as well. Uh, what was the problem? Oh, uh, this, one, this one assumes that you can use again, that uh, you can become, that you can, can change. If you're an addict, then you can go back to habituate, well, you can go back to social recreational drinking. Uh, so if you're an alcoholic, you can, you can go back to another, to another stage. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think once you, once you uh, stop using, then you need to never use again. Uh, otherwise, you, you, you may go back. Uh, talking to a lot of alcoholics, um, what, what, is, what do alcoholics talk about? So recovered alcoholics, recovering alcoholics, what do they talk about? When they used to drink? Yeah, that's all they ever talk about. That's the most fun they've ever had is when they were drunk. <laughs> Remember when I got drunk and took off my pants and put them on my head and started dancing around? I was at a party one time. Jeez, man, that was 17 years ago. You haven't had a drink in 17 years. That's all you talk about. It's when you were drunk. It just doesn't make any sense. So my point is that in the, even you looking at this model, if you, if you think about those times and you start drinking again, guess what's going to happen? Well, you can't ever go back to this point. You'll, you'll become an addict again. You'll start using again. You'll start hoping for the same joys that you got the first time you, you or when you were drinking before. When you, were, when you were so silly. Anyway, the academic model, uh, addiction occurs when the body adapts to the toxic effects of, of the drugs at the biochemical and cellular levels. Natural balance has been thrown off, causing four physiological uh, changes. Uh, first of all, you develop tolerance. Secondly, you develop uh, tissue dependence. Uh, you have withdrawal syndrome because of the tissue dependence and the level of tolerance you have and you have psychological dependence, of course. Uh, the problem with uh, these individuals who, who are talking about drinking is that they, have, they still have psychological dependence on that drug. Uh, they, think, they think back to the times when they were drinking. They still see that as the best times of their lives. Um, I told you how boring I am. Uh, that's, I'm quoting my ex-wives, and the reason I'm quoting my ex-wives is because well, one of them, at least one of them, uh, thinks that uh, one of the reasons I was so boring was because I didn't drink. 
at least one of them. I don't know. I haven't talked to the other one in a really, really long time. <clears throat> the diathesis stress model, this model was first developed to explain the causes of schizophrenia. Now, there may be a reason why my two, I married two women who uh, were uh, strange, uh, and uh, there may be a reason why I didn't follow their, their lead, and I'm going to explain that in just a second when we get into the hereditary part. Uh, the diathesis uh, stress model uh, was first developed to explain why white people have schizophrenia. Uh, it is a combination of the addictive disease model and the behavioral environmental model. Diathesis uh, means a predisposition or a vulnerability to, and in this case, the individual may have a genetic and environmental predisposition to drug abuse, to, to drug addiction. Would you say the reservation has a predisposition for uh, alcohol and drug use? Yay or nay? Does this environment support that type of behavior? There's a reason why I talk about other reservations and I say these reservations have more of a problem than this reservation has. For one thing, your reservation, the, the people live are so spread out on this reservation. Uh, other reservations, people live on top of each other. Not, I'm not talking about the Hopi, I'm talking about up north. Uh, they have uh, communities like Navajo where all the houses are really close together. Up in Montana, all the houses look like that. So they, th their environment is totally different than it is up here. That environment induces people to act like each other. And because of that, if one person's an alcoholic, uh, they get their neighbor to start drinking with them, and now all of a sudden we've got a whole uh, cluster of individuals that are, that are drinkers. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, I'm a man and, and I drink and, th and this is the way I act. Uh, if you want to be a man, you have to drink the, the same whiskey that I do. Uh, and that's the way it works up there, kind of. Uh, anyway, so their environment is more inducive, conducive uh, to, to drug use. Uh, so there are environments that are like that. Uh, people that live in ghettos, uh, people that live in, in, uh, in, in fairly negative economic situations, uh, what, what we refer to as ghettos. Uh, that uh, induces, that environment induces addiction uh, more than a, uh, uh, a wealthy neighborhood where everybody has huge yards and, and uh, everybody is, has uh, four or five acres of, of yard that they, uh, between the houses. You know, that is not conducive to uh, addiction, but the closer people live together, the more likely that this kind of stuff is going to happen. Stress triggers the drug need, and the stronger the diathesis, uh, the more likely that the individual will drift into addiction because they want to be like everybody else. Uh, the military is, a, is another good example. When I was in the military and my first wife left, uh, my friends took me out to get me drunk. They said, we can fix this. They didn't fix anything. All they did was, was feed me a lot of beer. Uh, that didn't fix anything. I still had a nine-month-old that wasn't weaned, and I still had a two-and-a-half-year-old uh, who, who uh, wanted to know where her mother was. It uh, didn't fix anything. All The only thing it fixed was that for two or three hours, I, I didn't worry about it. That didn't fix anything. didn't fix anything at all. But the military environment is kind of that way. Uh, if, uh, if, if you suffer from uh, any kind of uh, stress, uh, then you go out and get drunk. Uh, that's what uh, milita military people do. You're in combat, you come out of combat, uh, you're worried, you, you're thinking about what happened, uh, so you go out and get drunk. That's the way it works. Uh, we had, uh, I, we were in uh, Kunsan. Yeah. No. Masawa. We were in Masawa, Japan. Uh, one plane was taking off, another plane was landing, uh, they made a mistake. Uh, the one plane landed on top of the other, killed the two pilots, two, the, the two individuals in the, in the bottom plane, killed those two guys. Uh, guess what they did that night after those two guys were killed? They, they held a funeral, they held a wake. No, everybody got drunk. Uh, the O Club, free, free booze at the, at the officers, officers club that night. They drank themselves into not thinking about it, not worrying about it. Of course, when you're in a combat situation, you've got to go out the next day and, and start killing people again. 
Uh, anyway, so that's part of the diathesis model. You know, there are environments that induce this type of behavior. Uh, heredity, uh, researchers have found that the genetics, uh, that genetics do, does influence addiction, but there's over 100 genes that have something to do with drug abuse. There are select receptors, there are gene transcription factors, there are select enzymes such as alcohol dehydrogenase that change uh, how rapidly you uh, process and metabolize alcohol, neuropeptides, G proteins, there are select transporters that have to do with these, uh, with these select addictions. Uh, looking at twin studies, Goodwin uh, found that it, of identical twins separated at birth, they were most likely to choose the addiction or abstinence patterns of their biological parents over their adoptive parents. They weren't living with their biological parents, yet they still adopted um, their pattern of drinking or of, of abuse or abstinence. So if you take a missionary's children and you uh, take one twin and you leave them in, uh, with the missionary and take the other twin and you give them to, to people that uh, drink a lot, guess what they're going to act like? Well, they're not going to act like the, their adoptive parents. They're going to act like their biological parents, their missionary parents. I know, I was reversing the process. Okay, what if you take two, two <laughs> twins from uh, a, a drunk? And this actually happened in my, in my hometown. Uh, in my hometown, we had, uh, there were a set of twins born to a lady that had no husband. Nobody knew who impregnated her. She didn't know who impregnated her. She was an alcoholic. Uh, she was a, she was a uh, heroin user. Uh, so they took those two twins away from her. They gave one of them she kept, and the other one they gave to uh, a farming family. This is the farming family with the 500 acres. This is the, the kid that uh, looks for marijuana every day. I know. His parents were churchgoers. They didn't just go to church on Sunday. They went to church on Wednesday. They went to Bible study on Wednesday. They read the Bible every night. Oh, my God, I hated going over to their house. They were all, oh, what, what's the... What's the passage we're reading tonight? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Small G God. <laughs> Chris is laughing. <laughs> oh, thanks for the, uh, the, the strawberry. That, that was a good strawberry. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, you ate the other two? I ate all three. <laughs> no, I ate one. Well, there were four? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, they were good. Maybe I got the best one. <laughs> Similar research uh, found that 61% of the sample maintained nicotine dependence similar to their biological parents, and 55% displayed the same alcohol dependence of their parents. This kid grew up with very religious parents, and he still turned out the way that he did. He's the one that impregnated three women at the same time, not at the same time. Anyway, he, he impregnated three women who gave birth within a week of one another. The only reason he joined the army was because he was running away from his ex-wife, his wife, and his girlfriend who were trying to get him to pay for their babies. He was a very attractive man, okay? Everybody thought he was very pretty. And so he's able to get away with all kinds of crap, like dating three women at the same time. Uh, anyway, and now he's, he's a drunk, and my brother beat him up. Uh, he's not a drunk, he he's a, he's a, uses marijuana to excess. Researchers looking at males in treatment found that children with one alcoholic parent had a 34% greater probability of being an alcoholic than the male children of a non-alcoholic. 34%, it gets worse. When both parents were alcoholics, the child had a 400% probability of being an alcoholic, 400%. It gets worse. How could it possibly get worse? Uh, if both parents and a grandfather are alcoholics, the individual has a 900% greater probability of being an alcoholic. 900%. Evidently, heredity has something to do with this. There are 28 million Americans who have one parent who is an alcoholic. 28 million people. I guess I'm lucky because neither of my parents were alcoholics. Uh, researchers have found that 70% of the severe alcoholics have a dopamine control gene 
called DRD2A1. DRD2A1. Uh, we can talk about this gene, that, and, and we talk about it in a lot of different of the, uh, the uh, uh, neurobiologists talk about DRD2A1 all the time. Uh, this seems to be the addictive gene. Among social drinkers, only 30% of these individuals have, have the gene. Only 30%. 70% of severe alcoholics have DRD2A1. That's a lot. <clears throat> When this gene is present, the individual has fewer dopamine receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens. Since many of the missing sites are D2 sites, the individual will need more intense stimulation to feel satisfaction. Have you ever been with somebody and they wanted to drive really fast and maybe turn off the lights and go down the road? And Have you ever been with that person? Scares the shit out of you, doesn't it? Well, that did me. Or somebody that wants to go skydiving. And maybe, you know, maybe not wear the parachute this time. I don't know. Climb mountains. Oh, let's climb the ice, you know. Who does that stuff? Well, this guy's the one that does that stuff. <laughs> this is the idiot that does that stuff. If you've ever seen the X Games, these people are doing all kinds of strange flips where they shouldn't have a broken neck on skateboards and on, on snowboards and all kinds of crazy stuff. Who does that stuff? Well, this is the guy that does that stuff. The one with DRD2A1. So instead of being an alcoholic, and he may also be an alcoholic or she, whichever the case may be, they, uh, they do dangerous things. <clears throat> this is, this is, these are the heroes. These are the people that, uh, that, that uh, somebody's shooting at them and they run directly into the muzzle of the, of the weapon. This is how stupid they are. Well, that's stupid's not the right word. Uh, my idea is to circle around behind them, okay? I don't want to go directly into the muzzle of that weapon. No, thank you very much. Anyway, so these, these are the individuals that do that kind of stuff. DRD 2A1. And hopefully you've never been around any of these people because they drive stupid. They, they just want, they're, they're just looking for thrills. They're, they're thrill seekers. The DRD2A1 gene seems to indicate uh, the tendency uh, for any problem behavior as it has been found in other addictive behaviors other than alcoholism, in gamblers, in kids with ADHD. <gasps> really? I know, kids with ADHD. Aberrant sexual behavior, overeating, antisocial personality disorder, and Tourette syndrome. Okay, I told you the story of my wife saying that I was the most boring person in the world. Guess who she married the second time? She married a truck driver that knocked her teeth out. <clears throat> hey, that's cool. The next guy she married was a cowboy, and he knocked the teeth on her other side of her mouth out. So she didn't have any teeth left. Well, she had the ones in the middle, but the teeth on this side, they hit her on the... <clears throat> so she lost her, her molars on the sides. <laughs> Uh, that's not funny. What am I laughing about? What am I laughing about? <laughs> so yeah, I'm the most boring person in the world. Why am I boring? Well, she was looking for somebody that did exciting things. And of course, potentially, one of those exciting things was aberrant sexual behavior. I just read a book called, uh, don't tell Sue I read this book. Uh, I just read a book called uh, field work in Ukrainian sex, and you would think, oh, geez, it's all about sex. Well, it wasn't really about sex. It was about this lady that had a problem uh, with her boy. She had a bad picker, so she ever, all of her boyfriends were abusive, and she seemed to like that, that abusive, uh, and, and she, uh, but she complained about it. That was the bizarre part. Anyway, so she married, or she, uh, she got all these boyfriends. So she's bragging about how beautiful, beautiful her legs are. Uh, she, her first boyfriend uh, takes out a cigarette lighter after they have sex for the first time and uh, he burns her legs, burns scars in, into her legs. I know, how, how sexy is that? Sounds like, like 30 shades of gray thing. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> 50, 60, 80, 90? How many shades of gray are there? 40? 12? I don't know. 
<laughs> so that's what they were looking. That's what my ex-wife was looking for. She was looking for some kind of aberrant behavior. She found that exciting. Uh, and yeah, sure, sure, I'm the most boring person in the world, as claimed by two different women. But uh, at least I didn't hurt anybody. Okay, Which, or knock anybody's teeth out, or stab anybody. <laughs> Some refer to this gene as the compulsivity gene and the process as the, re as the reward deficiency syndrome. Uh, people with DRD2A1 uh, tend to consume large quantities of psychoactive substances before becoming intoxicated and then have greater dysfunction when they get drunk, such as blackouts and brownouts. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who blacks out when they're drunk. Uh, I had a guy that, a uh, good friend of mine, came to my house one night and started screaming at me just screaming at me. I'm going, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, yesterday I'm the nicest guy in the world and today I'm a, wait a minute, that sounds like one of my wives, doesn't it? I'm the worst person in the whole wide world. What's going on? And the next day I saw the guy and I said, why did you come to my house last night? He said, I didn't come to your house last night. What are you talking about? He was drunk. And he hardly ever drank, but this time he got drunk and came over. And I thought he was going to attack me. <clears throat> which would have been funny because he could, you know, it's one of those, he can't make a fist. He can lift his arm, but he can't make a fist. And swing. It's one of the, that's how drunk he was. Anyway, uh, the next day he told me that he didn't know anything about it. And he was definitely, he was really, 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 really sorry that he came over to my house and called me all those horrible, horrible names. What's a brownout? A brownout is when you... Partial, you know partially what's going on. Uh, people that get blackouts and brownouts, uh, uh, it's, it's almost like they're in a, they're in a hypnotic state. Um, a blackout is they don't remember anything. And a brownout is that they kind of remember what they were doing. Uh, of course, the, usually what they remember, this is like somebody that gets drunk and thinks they had a really, they're really good dancers. And they went out there and they really, you know, Busted a move, and the reality is everybody was laughing at them because they looked so stupid. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's brownouts, they, at least they remember dancing. Blackouts, they wouldn't remember going out there and doing anything. This is very common up north with, with the natives up north. Uh, they black out and brown out. And they claim that all Indian, of course, everybody thinks that they are the quintessential. Native American, they claim that every, all Indians do this. I always thought it was a little strange. Okay, so we get have DRD2A1, uh, but there's another gene. There's another gene that keeps you from, from have, being so stupid. There, there are also genes that make it less likely that a person will develop addiction. DRD4 uh, gives individual an excess of dopamine, which has been uh, shown to play a role in spiritual acceptance, making it less likely that the individual will accept the addictive lifestyle. In other words, they've got enough D2 uh, receptor sites. Uh, so just a little bit of alcohol is going to give them uh, a buzz. Uh, so they won't, they're, they're less likely to, to have to become uh, inebriated in order to have a good time. The people that are DRD4, uh, these are the individuals that have that problem. Now I'm guessing I don't have an addictive personality. Uh, I don't obsess over things. Uh, Sue was complaining about it today. I was talking to her. She was saying, you, nothing ever bothers you. Well, that's true. Nothing ever bothers me. Man, maybe it's because I'm DRD4. Maybe it's because I'm I'm an introvert instead of an extrovert. I don't know what the deal is, but uh, I don't have the, I don't have this problem. Uh, I told you I, I had I've been drunk three times and got sick after every time I was drunk. So I don't do it anymore. I mean, it makes sense. It's very logical. <sighs> I just don't have the same reaction that, that other people have. Um, interactions with the environment, uh, but especially the home environment, make new nerve cell connections and alter the neurochemistry that the individual was born with, determining if and how the individual will use psychoactive substances. Factors in the environment, if you were physically, sexually, or emotionally abused, it changes your, your, uh, your genes. Uh, stress, the more, more stress you're under, the more likely that you will 
uh, have a negative uh, reaction. If you're getting love in your uh, your uh, environment, that's that's a, uh, a real positive thing. If you live in poverty, of course, this can change your uh, genetic structure. Uh, the living conditions, if they're nice, one uh, you may have one reaction. If they are bad, you may have a totally opposite reaction. The family relationship, uh, that's very important. Uh, nutritional balance, uh, if you're not getting the right foods, of course, that's going to change your genetic structure. Uh, whether you get health care or not, whether you're treated for diseases. Uh, neighborhood safety, if you're always scared. What was I reading last night? Oh, I was reading about a kid from Pakistan. Or, no, Afghanistan. He's from Afghanistan. And he's a, a fan of uh, Lionel Messi, the greatest soccer player, modern soccer player, uh, from Argentina. He's from Argentina. Uh, anyway, so he, uh, he made himself a, a Messi jersey. And then, and then his parents took a video tape of this, him playing soccer. You know, he's a four-year-old kid playing soccer with this, uh, with this Messi jersey on. Uh, Messi's from Argentina. It's light blue and, and white stripes. Uh, the numbers are black. And, of course, he did all this with a pen. Uh, he created his own uh, uh, soccer shirt. Uh, so uh, Messi saw this, and uh, he sent the kid uh, two autographed uh, shirts, Messy soccer shirts, and he sent him a soccer ball. Um, well, the Taliban, this is in Afghanistan, the Taliban got wind of this, and now the kid can't go out, out to play. He can't go outside because, for one thing, they're afraid that he'll be kidnapped, uh, and for another thing, they're afraid that he'll be executed by the Taliban uh, because of you know, whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, so he can't go outside anymore. He can't play soccer. And he was a pretty good soccer player. As, as a four-year-old, he's juggling, you know, and he's kicking the ball. He's got a real good leg. But now he can't even go outside. So all of that has changed. So his neighborhood safety, living in Afghanistan, is really, really bad. It's extremely bad. Uh, the quality of school, he doesn't go to school anymore either, which is kind of a bad thing. Uh, so if you go to a good school and you learn a lot of things and you have good teachers, that's one thing. If you have bad teachers uh, who don't actually teach you anything, uh, then that will change your, your genetic uh, structure and your environment as well. Uh, peer pressure, how much peer pressure are you feeling from the people around you? Uh, the Internet, uh, and this is a new one. The Internet is, is brand new. The Internet's only been around since 1993. Uh, we don't know what kind of effects it's going to have on people. Uh, you guys are probably children of the internet, um, but how many of you were born before 1993? Before 1993. I can't even add this stuff up. Okay, so most of you have, have grown up with the internet. I mean, when you were one year old, you could go on the internet. Uh, those of you who are older than that, your brain had started maturing before you were able to get on, onto the internet. Now this may change psychology completely. Uh, whatever it was that you were, you were doing on the internet, playing, I don't know, whatever games you were playing or whatever, I have no clue. But it's going to change things. It's going to change everything. Um, uh, who was I talking to? <laughs> we were talking about degrees. Oh, we we're talking about uh, PhDs the other day, and uh, I got my PhD in 2012, but uh, I, I was an undergraduate in 1967. In 1967, there was there were no computers, okay? But uh, and and my my first four degrees, uh, there there was no internet, so I had to do all my research in the library. You know, I had to look everything up, uh, and now of course you can just click on on a database and find everything that you're looking for. I mean, it's changed everything completely. So we were, one person was talking, I mean, Miss Sarah, I was talking to Sarah about it the other day. It was really kind of interesting. She's young. She's really, really young. You guys don't understand her. She's 30 years younger than me. Maybe more. That's a lot. I had already had almost all my degrees before she was born. So that's one of the things, you know, so, is she the same age as your kids? She's younger than both of them. I think she was born in 77. 
my son was born in 72 and my daughter was born in 65. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, we bought our kids an Atari <laughs> when they first came out. <laughs> uh, an Atari. It Pong. Anyways. Uh, television has changed completely since uh, I was a kid, of course. Uh, even since my kids were kids. Uh, cable television, and now you guys have Netflix, you've got Hulu, you've got, I don't know. There's one that starts with a V. Voodoo? No? Voodoo? I don't know. You guys have all this stuff. So, I mean, you watch any television you want. Uh, environment, uh, the environment uh, molds the brain's architecture and neurochemistry determining how the individual will react to the outside influences. We've got a lot of kids that don't ever go outside, they just play on the internet. They play video games, uh, they create uh, uh, icons, they're not icons, avatars. They create avatars, uh, they, they identify more with their avatar than they do with themselves. Whatever, whatever personality their avatar has, and, and I don't think avatars have negative personalities, do they? They're always heroes, and they're always strong. It's kind of like Jumanji, the Welcome to the Jungle, that, that movie where, he, you know, the, the real wimpy kid's got, he's, he's got all these strengths, and then the, the big strong guy, he's, his weakness is strength. <laughs> and cake, right? <laughs> That's a funny movie. Anyway, so, uh, you know, all these, some of these kids, they never go outside. They don't have to go outside. Their, their avatar is more real than everything else, anything else. Uh, this is especially true in the first 10 years of life. So if you allow your children to play video games and to become involved in all this stuff, uh, within the first 10 years of their lives, potentially this is what's going to happen. They're going to become gamers for the rest of their, uh, potentially for the rest of their lives. What does it mean to be a gamer? Uh, what, you know, what, what kind of an impact does that have? And I don't have an answer to that. You guys are going to have to answer this question. There may be negative things that happen. Uh, we're seeing a lot more people who are mass shooting. Uh, we've never saw this many before. Now all of a sudden, you know, 21-year-old kids are going out with a 9mm pistol and, and killing everybody in a bank. Who does that? Well, people are doing it now. Is it, is it, does it have anything to do with video games? We don't know. We're, we haven't figured that out yet. We had that kid that, uh, oh, today is the uh, one-year anniversary of the shooting in Florida. Yeah, Parkland shooting. 17 kids. He killed 17 kids. Why did he kill so many people? He shot him in the head. That's why. Uh, I don't, well, you, you don't want to know about what it looks like when somebody gets shot in the head. It's not pretty. Not with a 9mm pistol. That's a, that's a pretty fast, that's a pretty rapid round. And it goes through and it make, does a lot of damage. Uh, it's not pretty. Why did he do it? We still have him. I mean, he's in jail. He didn't commit suicide. Uh, can, we should ask him. We need to find out why in the world he went into his old high school and killed nine, uh, 17 kids. Uh, the brain develops from the front to the back, uh, meaning that adolescents are more prone to, to poor impulse control behaviors like substance abuse. So you're pretty damn stupid when you're a teenager. And it's not your fault, it's just the way the world works. So you make bad choices. Sometimes uh, you date the wrong person, sometimes you get, uh, sometimes somebody gets pregnant uh, by mistake, uh, and, and these are, are choices, sometimes these aren't even choices, these are just things that happen. Recent research shows that it takes at least 20 years for the brain to become hardwired, and the prefrontal lobe continues to grow until around the 44th year. Uh, one of the things we're noticing now is that there are fewer teenage pregnancies than there have been in the past. We're not exactly sure what's going on. And if we do know what's going on, we, we, we try to pretend we don't know what's going on. <laughs> there may, may be something else going on, and I'm not going to talk about it in here, because Sue will get all pissed off. <clears throat> and I don't want Sue to be, get angry. Memories are established through a network of neurons involving select neurotransmitters. Uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, uh, dopamine, this is how you establish memories. 
Uh, if we add adrenaline to that, uh, then that memory tends to be stronger. And one of the reasons that PTSD is, is prevalent uh, in an individual that has gone through these uh, uh, a traumatic event is because of the epinephrine, is because of the adrenaline. Uh, normally, if I can make you smile, uh, your norepinephrine and your, serot and your dopamine will increase the probability that you'll remember things. If I can, if I can make you smile, uh, that's why I keep trying to get Chris to smile. Okay. <laughs> there are more. There are more in. Uh, at, the more an action is repeated, the more likely that the individual will remember it. Remember, it takes three times to, to put something into your memory. Uh, just you need to repeat the, the same uh, act over and over again, three, just three times. Uh, so in athletics, if you practice something three times, usually you're. You got it. It's, it's there, if you can do it three times. And this is one of the reasons why, if you've ever been on a team, your coach made you run a play until you got it right. He wanted you to do it the three times. And sometimes that may take ten times, but you're not doing it right. So we want you to do it right, so that in the game, uh, it becomes automatic. At that point, it becomes muscle memory. Unless the memory is emotionally intense, in which uh, case the memory has a stronger memory network, hence the intrusive memories of a traumatic event that may end up causing post-traumatic stress disorder. The reason it uh, causes post-traumatic stress disorder is it only takes one time if adrenaline or uh, norepinephrine is involved in the, in, in the action. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why, if you've ever been around military people, military people in a combat situation, the first time they're in combat, everything's, they're all scared and everything. Uh, but the military trains them not to react emotionally to, uh, uh, to a situation. Uh, and if they cannot react emotionally, then it's just normal memory that's taking place. Uh, if, they can, if they can reduce the amount of adrenaline or noradrenaline uh, that they are uh, pumping through their system, then they're less likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder. We thought we had this fixed once upon a time. Uh, when they started the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we thought we had this fixed because we had a new drug and that drug blocked adrenaline and, and uh, noradrenaline. Uh, so we thought we were going to, sh to uh, reduce the amount of PTSD coming out of that war. Uh, Vietnam was about, uh, about a third of the people coming out of Vietnam came out of Vietnam with PTSD. So we thought we had it fixed because we could block the adrenaline with this stuff. So they'd go out, they would do whatever they did, and when they came back, we would give them a shot of this stuff, this, uh, this chemical that blocked the adrenaline. Uh, as it turned out, uh, we couldn't give them the shot before they went out. That didn't work. Then they, they didn't react properly to, uh, to stimulation. Uh, so we couldn't give it to them before they went out. We could give it to them after they went out, but the ad adrenaline had already been excited. So it didn't work at all. We thought it was going to work. And this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Bush, George W. Bush was bragging about the fact that they had fewer PTSD because, because we had this new substance. Uh, so he was saying, oh, you know, we can leave them in combat. We can send them back for multiple tours and they'll be fine. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why so many people went back time after time after time. They were thinking, the military was thinking, that they were cutting down on the, the amount of, of PTSD. Of course, it didn't work. Unfortunately, it didn't work. It was a good idea, but it just didn't work in, in practice. Uh, children growing up in a chaotic environment where there is, is excessive emotional pain can uh, deal with the pain in several ways. Uh, think of, of uh, your relatives and your friends uh, who are potentially in a chaotic environment. How did they react to the chaotic environment that they were in? Uh, sometimes they can just deal with it. They just deal with it. Uh, they face the problem, they face the chaos, and they just deal with it. Hopefully this is the way you do it. This is the way uh, things happen. Uh, find people uh, to help with, uh, them deal with it. Maybe they found a relative uh, that they could talk to, uh, a grandparent, an aunt, or an uncle. Uh, potentially it was somebody at school that they could talk to, that they could disclose this information to. That helped take care of the situ situation as well. Uh, they can accept what happened. You know, it's a horrible situation. 
uh, and, and maybe uh, they just accept it. Maybe you, you know somebody who's a runaway, and they just kept running away from their home, and nobody knew exactly what was going on. Uh, but that's one way that you can get away from, from the chaotic environment, is by running away. Uh, they can become hyperactive. Wait a minute. ADHD again? Is this ADHD? So what if we treat these kids that are in a chaotic environment and they're acting hyperactive, what if we treat them with, with Ritalin or, or Adderall? What's going to happen next? Are these kids really ADHD? No, it's just the way that they're reacting to their chaotic environment. So if we treat them with Ritalin or, or Adderall, is it going to work? No. We're just going to make them more hyperactive. This is one of the reasons why a doctor needs to decide whether a kid really is ADHD or not. Are they really ADHD? Or is it the environment that they're in? If it's their environment, treating them with Ritalin or Adderall is not going to help anything at all. It's going to make it worse. Um, they can become angry and fight, and now all of a sudden they have anger issues. And possibly you've seen people uh, that had this reaction. Uh, they can make jokes. They can become a joker. A lot of comedians had a really horrible, chaotic life before they became comedians. But they learned the way to dissipate that was to was to be funny. They were the funny person in the family. And it works. Uh, Richard Pryor uh, went to jail. <laughs> went to jail for using, uh, what was it, freebase. He was freebase and he went to jail. But he said, uh, everybody, wa everybody wanted to be my lover, but uh, I joked him out of it. I, I teased him out of it. And, and he told jokes all the time. That's how he, he kept from being raped in prison, at least that's what he said. Uh, they can become addic uh, addictive. Uh, they can use drugs, they can become addicted on drugs, uh, food, gambling, or sex. I know we keep talking about sex. Uh, some people don't use sex, they don't, they use sex as a, as a, as a tool. Uh, they use sex as a way to, to uh, uh, take themselves away from a bad uh, situation. Uh, young girl, she's 12 or 13 years old. Uh, her, she doesn't have a father at home, uh, so she's looking for a boyfriend. Uh, well, how in the world does a 13-year-old find a boyfriend? Well, she has sex with someone. So she's using sex as an instrument, as a, as a tool. And we see this a lot more frequently than we see people using gambling. Uh, we see individuals who are overeaters. We see people who are anorexic or bulimic, uh, and they're using food as a way to uh, to dissipate uh, this chaos in their environment. This is a, a means of control. If somebody uh, uses drugs, they, they use it when they feel like it. So they have control. Uh, food, they eat, overeat or they, they undereat. Uh, this is them controlling their environment. Uh, the gambling, not so much, but the sex is another situation. So all of a sudden, as a 12-year-old, she's got a boyfriend. And so she starts having sex with her boyfriend, because that's the way you, you keep a boyfriend. And now she's using sex as a tool. And it, it will become a tool for her for the rest of her life. Now, the sad thing is that it it is a tool now. This is not something that she does for fun. This is not something she does because she wants to. She does this because she has to control her environment. So it becomes a means of control. So it loses its meaning, sadly. Are you getting the picture? This is not something that she does to reproduce. This is something she does to control her, her environment. This is the way that she controls her environment. If the stress continues over time, the counterbalancing behavior will become ingrained in the, in the brain and becomes part of the individual's personality, of course. Uh, so you may have somebody that's a runaway. Uh, they run away from every situation. Even when they become adults, if, if they are in a stressful situation, they pick up and go. Uh, my second wife was that way. Remember I told you she, 
I didn't even know she was leaving me. She had an assignment, and she didn't tell me. That was the weird part. And I had a friend down there who's the one that made all the assignments. And afterwards he said, yeah, I, I was wondering if you were going to go with her. Uh, I wanted to ask you, but she told me I couldn't. I mean, of course, this is all, it's like FERPA and HIPAA and all that other stuff. You can't tell people, you can't t give people this kind of information. And she went, it wasn't a secret assignment, but she went to, she went to a base where they flew SR-71s. Blackbird, it's a spy plane. <laughs> but she went to this base. She went to a base, so uh, so her her uh, orders were secret uh, because she was going to a secret, not a secret base, but she was she had orders for a base that had a secret mission. So um, her orders were were classified. That's the way they. That's the way they said. Anyway, so she left. She's a runaway. She did. The, I wasn't her first husband. I wasn't her first husband. I was her third husband. Yeah, I was her third husband. And she had run away from all of them. And when she ran away, she left everything. And so she left me with all the stuff that she bought. We were only married for five months, but all the stuff that she was that she bought, she left. The washing machine, the dryer, uh, we had a new television set. So when I left, I left all of her stuff there. I didn't take it with me. She usually left her husband. The first time she got a divorce, she bought a trailer, and they were living on her property. And this was a she had a trailer and a washing machine and, and you know all this furniture. And she left it with him. She left it for him. She just took off, and she took, just left with her clothes. The second husband, same way, and of course me, she did the same way. She was a runaway. And this is how she had uh, handled her environment, was by running away. And she did that every time she was in a situation she couldn't handle. What, what couldn't she handle about my relationship? Well, it was the fact that she wanted to drink and she couldn't, or she wouldn't, around me. I never, well, I just saw her drink that one time when we had that faux drinking contest, and she pretended she was drunk on a beer and a half. And I won. <laughs> yeah, like I want a drinking contest. <laughs> I'm so good at it. Uh, in the future, when an unwanted emotion arises, they will they will uh, be drawn to the simplest solution, and of course, that is always the counterbalancing behavior. So, if it's anger, they will become angry if that's the way that they handle their chaotic environment. If it's running away, they'll run away. If it's making jokes, they'll make jokes. Uh, if it's hyperactivity, they will become obsessive about something. This is how they handle stressful situations. They will go back to the way they were doing things before. Now, you may look at your own lives and go, Oh my God, I do that. Probably. <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they work. That's how they operate. The people most likely to abuse drugs uh, have stress in uh, common in their home. Uh, they abuse some kind uh, that occurs in the home. The abuse of some kind in occurs in the home. In other words, they're being abused in the home. Uh, just re I'm reading a novel right now about Korea, and uh, these individuals. The, the the book starts before in like in 1932 uh, or something, uh, when Korea was being controlled by the Japanese. Um, oh, abuse in the home. Uh, so <laughs> you know. So we're going through time, and we're 40 years later, and here all these women are going, uh, my, lot, my lot in life is to be abused, is to be, is to be, is to struggle. That's what they say. My lot, lot in life is to accept abuse. And all of these women married men that you know, never cooked anything, couldn't cook anything, never cleaned the house, you know, that kind of crap. Anyway, so abuse uh, is... Uh, uh, occurs in the home. And for these women, the abuse had to do with the fact that they had to do all the work. Uh, all of them had children, and the husbands couldn't uh, support uh, the families, so the women had to uh, support the families. Drugs or drinking are commonly used in the home or among the individual's peers. Uh, the people that you hang out with uh, are the people that you are the most likely to emulate. 
Uh, if everybody around you, if all of your friends drink, then the probability that you're not going to drink is not very good. Uh, it's really hard for you to be different from your friends. Uh, healthy ways of reacting to stress or anger aren't learned. Uh, and that's mainly because there is chaos in the home. Uh, society tells the individual that psychoactive substances are normal and an acceptable way to solve life's problems. If you live in select environments, uh, then that's just the way it works. Uh, that environment tells you that this is, this is normal, that, uh, that drugs are normal. And of course, that's what we're going through right now as far as marijuana is concerned. There are states that are legalizing marijuana, and the reason they're legalizing marijuana is because people in that state are saying this is normal behavior, this is okay, this is not that destructive, it's better than alcohol. They keep using that as an excuse to legalize marijuana. The largest state in the union has, has legalized marijuana. California is the most populous state in the union, has legalized marijuana. Uh, they're living in a community where access to legal and illegal drugs are easy, like in Colorado. I haven't been, to, I've never been to Cortez. I'm afraid to go to Colorado now, to tell you the truth. Uh, my son lived up there when they legalized marijuana, and it was just got off. I don't know if things have gotten better, if things have gotten worse. I have no idea. <clears throat> but, uh, it's, uh... It's, it's normal, it's common, it's, it's something that everybody accepts. There are pre-existing mental conditions exacerbated by the negative home, home environment. Uh, healthy brain chemistry can't be maintained because of poor nutrition. That's a problem. The media inundates the individual with advertisements supporting the use of select psychoactive substances. We haven't seen any advertisements on television dealing with marijuana yet. I'm a little surprised. We're living this close to the state and they're not asking people to come and have a pot party in there. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> there are people uh, take, uh, will take the train from Nebraska in, into Colorado. <clears throat> and when they cross the state line, they, they light up, they blaze up. <laughs> as strange <laughs> as that may seem. And they have these parties, uh, New Year's, they have these parties where people are just wandering through the state, uh, getting, getting stoned. One belongs to a peer group where excessive use of psychoactive substances is normal. And of course, if you hang out with the, with the tokers, then probably people assume that you're a toker as well, or a drinker or whatever. Heredity in the environment may prime an individual for addictive behavior, but it is a psychoactive substance that they decide to use that will determine the impact the addiction will have on their lives. If you're just a drinker, you're probably going to be okay. If you're using an illegal substance, then potentially you're going to run into more trouble. If you're taking a drug that potentially can kill you, then maybe eventually you'll kill yourself. <clears throat> Heroin is very, very dangerous. As it turns out, fentanyl will kill you. I was surprised that 1% of the high school seniors had used Flocka. Flocka is bath salts. It makes you stupid. It makes you do really strange things. And it's not, one supply of Flocka will not, not be the same as another supply of Flocka. It's a synthetic drug. And it's made in China. We have no idea what's in it. And this stuff, uh, it's really hard to, to, to make it uh, illegal because <clears throat> it's a different chemical structure every time it comes in. So we're, we're not exactly sure what to do with this stuff. This is the stuff that makes people zombies. It makes them eat people's faces and whatnot. As strange as that may seem. So we're not exactly sure what's going on with this stuff. It's real serious down in Florida. You guys don't have to worry about it, but my son does because he's, he teaches math in, in Florida. So, and it's there. It's where he is. So, uh, and uh, it's like PCP. You can't confront somebody that's on Flocka because they'll go off on you. And you never know what, they'll grab anything to, to attack you. So, they're warning their teachers what's going to happen next. 
Excessive drug use will not only make the individual more uh, susceptible to more and more use, but more vulnerable to other stronger drugs. And of course, we talked about gateway drugs. Actually, we didn't talk about gateway drugs. That's an article I just read. Uh, they, were, they were giving the, the statistics as far as gateway drugs were concerned. Cannabis is a gateway drug. Uh, people that use cannabis, that usually they don't stop there. Sometimes they do, and they'll just smoke pot for the rest of their lives, like my friend, who actually uh, was, was addicted to Thai sticks when he was in Vietnam, but when he came back, he got off the, the, uh, the heroin, and uh, now he's just smokes pot. But that's, he's not a very nice person. It's not a lot of fun. Steals, steals money from his, he used to steal money, his mother has died. By this time. Psychoactive drugs, uh, select psychoactive substances, particularly methamphetamine, cause the death of brain cells through a process known as apoptosis, where damaged cells are programmed to kill themselves. Uh, this is the way it works in your brain. Uh, so you don't have to even, uh, it's not the alcohol that's actually killing the cell. What's happening is it's damaging the cell and then the cell self-destructs. That's the way it works. So you're, you're melting your brain away, which is kind of fun if you think about it. Uh, okay, is that right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> How much time do I have? Can I get through these? Yes, Psych uh, nicotine produces an immediate and long-term change in the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, which leads to the faster development of tolerance and dependence. It is the number one addictive substance in the world, nicotine. I know, tobacco. Some drugs have a greater power to positively reinforce and therefore compel uh, to a continued use, such as cocaine and heroin. And this is the reason that people are addicted to heroin or opioids. Uh, so you start using OxyContin because the doctor says you need to make that pain go away. All of a sudden you're, you, you're trying to find heroin. Uh, you're looking for fentanyl, thinking of course this is 100 times stronger than the uh, morphine. Uh, and uh, you don't know how much to give yourself. So you overdose and kill yourself. Uh, compulsive obsessive behavior mimics drug use, which in turn uh, causes the brain to be rewired. Uh, gambling will do this, eating will do this, shopping will do this with select individuals, uh, sexual activity will do this for some select individuals, video games, and we really haven't dealt with video games. Uh, is, it a, is it really that bad, letting your kids play video games? Probably not as long as it's a control as long as it's control. Well, what if it's compulsive behavior and they can't stop? What if they play for 72 hours straight? Has anybody ever played a video game for over 24 hours? See, you're supposed to sleep. You know, in 24 hours you're supposed to sleep about like eight hours. So if anybody's ever stayed up all night to play a video game and then played into the next day, has anybody ever done that? No? Yes. <laughs> how long how long did you play? 24? 48? No. I stayed up. 32? No. You didn't play for 32 hours straight? <laughs> <laughs> See, you're not a very good game. You're not a gamer. <laughs> uh, when I was up north, uh, we had I had three students. And uh, all of them, uh, they, they, that's all they did on the weekends, played Halo, or Halo 2, all weekend. I, they'd shoot people in the head all weekend long. And they would not go to sleep. They stayed awake on Code Red. I, yeah, it's Code Red. They were, they were Code Red ad addicts. Anyway, 72 hours, every weekend. They'd start Thursday night. They didn't have class on Friday. And they'd stay up all the way through Sunday. Sometimes... They would not come to class on Monday because they were still playing the game. And somebody had to win. I don't know how it goes. As stupid as all that sounds. And, of course, Internet use. Uh, sometimes you can go on the Internet and all of a sudden you're looking at something else and then you see something really interesting over here and so you go someplace else and all of a sudden you burned up like four or five hours looking at nothing. Not really seeing anything. I mean, just burning up Research with video game usage has shown that dopamine is released in the reward reinforcement pathway when an individual uh, plays video games, an amount uh, equivalent to methamphetamine usage. 
is released, of course, uh, so you get the same buzz. Uh, PET scans of compulsive eaters has demonstrated that there is a decreased number of dopamine uh, D2 receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens uh, with people with compulsive behavior. So if you know anybody that's OCD, the problem may be that they don't have enough D2 receptor sites. So they're looking for stimulation. They're seeking stimulation. And they get their stimulation from a select thing. Uh, so that may have something to do with OCD. Research shows that between 25 to 63 percent of compulsive gamblers have been dependent on alcohol or other drugs sometime in their lives. It has been demonstrated that gambling creates brain disruption similar to drugs or alcohol usage. So, compulsive gamblers. I know. It's, it's, so it's not their fault. Well, sure it is. But it's a disease. Well, not really. This is something that you voluntarily do. I, most people don't go out and get uh, a cold voluntarily, right? You don't go around kissing people with a cold so hoping that you get one. I don't think that's the way it works. The drug that pushes the individual hardest and quickest into addiction is smoking nicotine and tobacco. Uh, second is uh, cocaine, crack cocaine. That's the stuff you smoke, crack cocaine. Third is uh, smoking or injecting heroin. It's the third most addictive substance in the world. Uh, fourth is injecting methamphetamine. Uh, this is a really ugly picture. This is a guy that has picked all the skin off of his arm because it itches. Because that methamphetamine makes his hair follicles stick up. This is why they shave themselves to get rid of all their hair so they won't be picking at themselves. Uh, fifth is uh, snorting cocaine, fifth most, most addictive substance. Uh, sixth is ingesting opioid painkillers like Oxycontin or Hydrocodone. Seventh is ingesting any amphetamines. Uh, eighth is ingesting sedative hypnotics like uh, Xanax or uh, Valium. Uh, Ninth is alcohol, so there you go, it's not all that addictive. Tenth is marijuana. Eleventh is PCP. Twelfth is caffeine. So those of you who had coffee this morning, don't worry about it, it's not that addictive. Thirteenth uh, is uh, MDMA or ecstasy, the rape drugs. And 14th is, or 14th is LSD, and 15th is peyote. The least addictive of all the psychoactive substances is peyote. So we've got peyote, LSD, we've got all the, the hallucinogens are the last, are not addictive hardly at all. So it's something, if you're a member of the Native American church, don't worry about it. You're not going to just want to go to the Native American church so that you can get stuck and get buzzed out or whatever. Don't worry about it. Okay, we're going to stop right here. We'll pick this up next time. I did finish chapter two. I know I'm so excited. I'll, we'll start.